Well, good day. I'm Dr. Thomas Perry, President of the Integrated Benefits Institute, and welcome to today's webinar sponsored by IBI and the National Alliance under a grant from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute on how employers can shape patient-centered outcomes. Next slide. So we have a great panel uh, that is joining us today that will have the bulk of the time. Uh, Dr. Bruce Sherman um, from the National Alliance will be with us. Lisa Evans from Southwire, Larry Becker from Xerox, recently retired, Ned Kusti from U.S. Steel, and I'll be the moderator today. Next slide. So over the last several years, the patient's perspective has received growing focus both by practitioners and by researchers. And given that employers cover the healthcare for about 60% of non, all non-elderly adults, it is clear that employers have an important role to play in supporting patient-centered care and better aligning programs with patient needs. Next slide. So today we're going to talk about research that uh, <clears throat> IBI and the Alliance engaged in, um, surveyed 200 employers to address the following research questions. First, what are employers trying to achieve through their health programs? Second, what sources of information do they rely upon for program decisions? Third, how do they judge success? Fourth, what partners do they rely upon? And fifth, how confident are employers that their programs are achieving patient-centered results? So I want to review the survey results briefly and spend the bulk of our time with our panel discussing the issues. Next slide. So first, we wanted to learn what employers desire to achieve from their health programs. Now, it wasn't long ago that the dominant answer would have been manage healthcare costs. And today we get a different view of what is very important to employers. So this slide shows us uh, how employers respond to the question of what is very important. Similar to findings from IBI's CFO research from several years ago, we see a much broader view of what employers desire to achieve than I think we might have guessed. In fact, the top three here, more than 90% for each response shown in the red bracket, are all focused on the employee. So helping employees improve and sustain good health, 91%. Ensuring health benefits are affordable to employees, 90%. Effectively communicating benefits to employees, 90%. Now, it's clear that costs are still important, but so are a variety of other outcomes of health, such as improved employees' ability to function on the job, improve the value of the investments in healthcare spending, recruit talent, and the like. So we see a rather broad perspective from employers of what they consider very important. Now, with that said, it's key to note that there may be a substantial difference between the aspirational goals and the benefit planning goals for employers that we'll, we'll get into a little bit later. Next slide. Now, I think it's clear to everyone that good decisions require the right data. So where do employers look for that data? Now, overwhelmingly, their focus is internal. More than nine in 10 say that analysis of internal data is very important to their decisions. In addition, more than half rely on peer professionals. But as you can see, the importance of other data sources drops precipitously from there. It is significant to note that only about a third of the employers that we surveyed find peer-reviewed research to be important sources for their decision-making. Next slide. And now to the basic disconnect between goals and actions, the type of data that employers use to understand the full impact of their programs. As you can see in the first three categories that are highlighted by the red bracket, Medical, pharmacy, and disability claims class data are the most prominent sources. However, on the bright side, nearly seven in 10 employers use employee surveys 
And depending on the composition of the survey instrument, that can be a leading indicator of better integrating employee-centered outcomes into health program decisions. Now, we must remember that claims data tell us what happened in the past to those who were covered and accessed care. Things like employee surveys, biometric screenings, HRAs, and focus groups can be very good indicators and forward-looking to get insights into what employees need as well as their perspectives. Next slide. Now, similarly to how they uh, view the importance of data, employers tend to look internally as to who they rely upon to help them make those decisions. Seven in 10 <clears throat> rely on experts within their company a lot. About half rely on consultants to that same degree. A little more than four in 10 rely on PBMs uh, as important. Uh, a little more, um, uh, now, it, it is important to note that only about one third rely on health service vendors a lot in making decisions. So one of their key partners, health service vendors, are not relied upon to a great extent to help employers make decisions. And it's interesting to me that TPAs, who often hold the data, are ranked way down the list from the standpoint of who employers rely upon to make decisions. Next slide. And I think this is where we see the disconnect most vividly. The degree of confidence that employers have that their programs are actually serving patient-centered needs. For example, only about half the employers we surveyed say that they are confident that their medical benefits help employees function on the job. They are less confident, between 46 and 40%, that their medical benefits ensure yeah. affordable care, are aligned with patient needs and values, and improve and sustain good health. Employers are far less confident that their wellness and well-being programs are meeting patient-centered needs, as you can see from these same categories. So how do employers close the gap between what they aspire uh, in the goals for their health programs and what they actually see their health programs are delivering? So with that as, be, as brief background, let's turn to the panelists and have a discussion because they're the ones I think that have real day-to-day -day insights. So next slide. As I mentioned, our panelists, Dr. Bruce Sherman, National Alliance, Lisa Evans, Southwire, Larry Becker, Xerox, Dr. Ned Kusti, U.S. Steel. So I'll, I'll first pose the, the first question to the entire panel, and we'll go in this order. So I know, Bruce, um, you've worked with many employers. What patient-focused outcomes are important to the employers that you've worked with and why? And then we'll go down the list with our other panel to that same question. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate the question. I think um, from a patient standpoint, improved health outcomes are probably the most significant um, for the organization because that is the best way, I think, for many employers to be able to understand the effectiveness of their, uh, of their benefits. Health status is um, typically pretty challenging to report. Most employers look at healthcare costs as a proxy for, uh, for health status with the presumption that if healthcare costs are declining, the health status has to be increasing, and that's not always the case. And Lisa, what about your perspective on the patient-focused outcomes that are important at Southwire? Well, I think, you know, we're a wire and cable company, so we're not in the healthcare industry per se, but we um, we focus on having a primary medical home. It's an accredited home. So we feel like that it's setting the standards for what is appropriate in state-of-the-art primary medical. We also think that penetration rates, how many people are using it? And are you using it for urgent care? primary medical care, and if you're using it for primary medical care, how are you dealing with your chronic patients, and how does pharmacy play into it? Those are all the things that, that we look at. Okay. And Larry, you spent, I won't say how many years at Xerox, but uh, you have uh, extensive experience, uh, in, and when you had your employer hat on, you know, at Xerox, 
um, what were the kinds of things that were patient focused that really uh, were important to you? And now that you're involved with PCORI uh, directly, um, how has that changed your thinking about patient-centered outcomes? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on the call. Um, so I think from a, an employee or a family perspective, it's really important and it has always been important that people are able to get the care they need from a trusted, knowledgeable, high-quality resource at a location that's convenient to them that they can afford. And I think that's sort of table stakes. That's where we start. Okay. And Ned, uh, what's your perspective on patient-centered outcomes at U.S. Steel? Uh, hi, Tom. Thank you for having me. Um, very similar to what Larry and Lisa mentioned, uh, you know, at, at our organization, we are working hard to identifying facilities and providers that would provide the best quality of care. But also we are looking at cost and, and you know, claims uh, cost management. Uh, there is a lot of focus on trying to provide the employees with the best health care services that are available to assure that they can uh, work safely. Uh, safety is a big, um, you know, uh, core principle in our in our practices here at U.S. Steel, and we would like to make sure that employees and their family members, obviously, are receiving the best quality um, health care that is available um, while helping them do their job, go back home, and not have to worry about any family member, any chronic conditions that would hinder them from being a productive employee. Okay, thank you. Now, let's turn to one of, I think, one of the key findings of the research, and that is the disconnect between what employers Say they aspire to in their health programs. And as you remember, we saw those patient-centered goals right up at the top. And what they actually judge uh, as the effectiveness of their programs and the data they collect. So what, why is that disconnect uh, occurring and what can employers do to kind of connect those dots? So I'd, I'd like to, to have each of the, the panelists respond to that. Bruce, why don't you go first? Sure. Thanks, Tom. Th I think the biggest issue is that our collective experience with the healthcare system is um, documented in claims data that employers receive. And as such, we don't really have a way of understanding outcomes other than patient center goals or outcomes other than um, what we receive in claims data. And I think it's a it's an unfortunate consequence of the way that uh, the data are shared with employers, uh, and I think there's an opportunity where there are other data sources that perhaps may be uh, may reflect other dimensions of workforce health and well-being to be integrated uh, instead of. Uh, of looked at as a siloed function. I think that the other piece of this relates to um, different organizational subpopulations that benefits uh, very likely aren't a one size fits all offering or shouldn't be. Um, and as such, we need to be mindful of uh, the, the different needs of different subpopulations and look at those in a way that perhaps more meaningfully allows for an understanding of uh, the whether those programs are actually achieving uh, the desired patient center goals. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that that I've observed over the last probably decade or maybe a little bit less is, and I think this is related to employers trying to meet patient center goals, is that the vast proliferation of new programs, kind of the latest shiny object. And I think one of the things that I see employers challenged with is as you implement new programs, you're getting a whole new set of reports from your vendors and it becomes harder and harder to link those together or to outcomes. So in some 
I see employers are learning more and more about narrower and narrower issues. And I think that certainly is, is leading to one of these disconnects. So Lisa, from your perspective at Southwire, uh, do you see disconnects between what you want to achieve and patient-centered outcomes and what you're actually able to do? Absolutely. I think for, for us, we're trying to go after behavior and it's simple with some things, whether you're looking at A1C levels for diabetics or how many programs do you have in place. For us, we stopped adding programs. You know, we've got the medical second opinion, we've got all the other things, and we're focusing more on developing an opportunity to put that information in front of people when it can benefit them the most. Um, that, okay. I think, is the nut that we've not cracked yet, so to speak, and I think it will carry us a long way. Yeah, you know, one of the other things I've observed in this is, and I think we are in transition, there's no doubt, but I think to a great extent, the message that employees have received for their, from their employers is your health matters because it costs us money. And that's not a great motivating principle, I think, for employees engaging in their health and the like. So I see this transition from, yes, your health matters because it costs us money, to your health matters to both of us. How can we get you involved and engage you? Now, Larry, Larry, we've talked a lot about some of the stuff that you've done at, at Xerox and, and some of the innovative programs that you implemented. You know, do you feel that you were really kind of on the front end of um, these patient-centered outcomes being an explicit part without a disconnect at Xerox, or, or how do you see this issue? Oh, there, are, there are clearly disconnects. And Tom, um, so let me, let me build on a couple of things. And, and you mentioned that, I, that I'm uh, on the, the board at uh, PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute. And, you know, we really integrate the patient in everything we do. And, and, and the best definition I heard of outcomes came from a patient who said, it's how I end up. And to that end, People's health needs start at different points and places, and they incur different health challenges. And people are differentially capable of, of attaining, you know, outcomes, even given the same disease that, um, but they're in a different environment or they have different resources. And, and so if you think about that in the context of an employer with a large population, it's very hard to design a benefits program that's done on average that meets the needs of very specific people and the outcomes they choose for themselves. So this is a high wire act that, you know, we have limited resources, limited dollars, uh, unfortunately limited knowledge. And, and so, Connecting those two things is hard work every day. And Larry, did you at Xerox um, rely on focus groups and, and employee discussions around these issues? Or how did you, you know, learn better what employees were looking for around their health? Well, um, at various times, uh, we literally go out and do roundtables around the country. Um, and I'll give you really one really quick example when somebody said, what are you going to do about the drug costs? And so we said, well, do you, do you use, for example, mail order where the copay is lower? And they said, I can't afford to use the mail order because I got to come up with three or two and a half payments all at once. And what that signal to us is we had to figure out a way at the front end of the year to, to put pe money in people's pockets so they could begin the trail to enable themselves. And those are sort of, you know, that's just one example of, aha, we build this average thing, but it isn't necessarily that good for a particular part of the population who have very specific needs. Mm, great example. And Ned, what about your view of this disconnect between the desires to incorporate patient-centered outcomes with the reality of, of managing benefit programs at USD. 
Thanks, Mike. Well, in addition to what was mentioned by uh, the panel here, you know, out of the box or off the shelf products will not work for um, most companies because you really have to tailor them uh, to your population's need and to make it fit the culture and the uh, the business needs and include all specific um, aspects of these programs to fit your population so that you can get the benefit. But even if you do that, and I want to give an example of a very basic example of the disconnect, even if you implement an excellent, and I'm talking like the best of the best excellent wellness program, and that program does receive good member engagement, uh, typically you should expect to see an initial increase in claim cost. Well, and for most typical employers who are looking at data coming from claim costs, that would be potentially translated to, well, this program is not working because look at look at the claim costs. The costs of the claims are going up. We're paying more money. This program does not work. Shut it down. So that that is that is like a challenge that we uh, employers see and and face every day. Mm -hmm. And I and I've heard the very same thing, Ned, about EAP programs. Uh, and EAP programs historically have been managed in a separate silo. And I think the underlying message was, well, you know, if more employees use our EAP programs, then the vendor's going to charge us more money. And it gets right back to this fundamental question of, well, what is it are you trying to achieve through those programs? And, and Bruce, I want to turn to you with this next question. You know, we saw that uh, only about half the employers said that uh, their health programs are um, very confident they're contributing to the ability of their employees to function on the job. Now, you and I have written a lot about uh, productivity outcomes both um, absence and performance. So how can employers do a better job of connecting those dots uh, beyond the claim costs that they seem to be focused on today? Uh, great, great question, Tom. I, I think the bigger issue is looking not just at the transactional experience or the overall cost of the of the medical benefit, but looking at the business consequences of use of those healthcare services. Are those, uh, are the health benefits um, improving health? Are they fostering greater uh, employee engagement and retention? Are they leading to greater uh, employee or organizational performance? Uh, are they re resulting in fewer work-related injuries? Uh, every organization has organizational performance metrics that are important to key business leaders. And I think there's an opportunity to uh, leverage those metrics with, uh, in combination with health-related measures to show the impact of improved workforce health on business performance, and that gets the mm -hmm. C-suite's attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, IBI right now is in the midst of a meta-analysis of 30 employers in different industries that have connected health and health engagement to operational business metrics. So I think you're absolutely right. If we can connect those dots, then we take a huge step from thinking about health benefits as a cost center to health benefits as a value proposition relative to business performance. And I think that that's one of the game changers that I see coming up. So Larry, let's, let's turn to you about one of certainly my favorite topics, which is of course data. Um, okay. You know, when you were, when you were at Xerox, you know, how did you use data to judge the success of your programs? And what were the limits and opportunities to better use data in your experience? And, and what were the roadblocks that, that you faced and what did you do about it? Well, I mean, let, let's start with the, the latter part of your question. And I think everybody on this call knows that data about health and healthcare is not transparent. And what we, what we have to work with, almost all of us, is really aggregate data. We don't really know about this person or that person, but we do know it in aggregate. 
And as a result, we're all too often working on averages. And no family or person is average and they have their own circumstances, their own needs, and, and as I said earlier, their, hope, their own hope for outcomes. And, and so the roadblocks and solutions, in my view, are two sides of the same coin. Transparency to their data and agency over their own data. Frankly, ownership, um, ownership of, of that data. And with that, tools can be developed to take the data, make it into useful information, which can be transformed into knowledge. And each person should be empowered to learn from those who came before them and also in turn educate or enable those who come after them. And oh, by the way, access to their information is especially important now as pe people may be in unfamiliar facilities and, and with unfamiliar clinicians caring for them given our current environment. And so, you know, data, data access is, is really important. And, and that's been a challenge. We've tried to work with vendors, um, with the health insurers and, and uh, the TPAs to try to make that data. And, and frankly, they don't really want to let that happen. And so we have to find ways to work together to, to sort of free that data. And I think things are starting to happen. Uh, CPR, you know, with Suzanne Del Banco and, 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 and others um, to try to make that happen. Now, Lisa, I know at Southwire, uh, you've talked about um, EMRs, um, electronic medical records. How has that played into your ability to get uh, better and more complete data to help uh, in the design of your benefit programs and to serve patient-centered uh, needs? Well, for us, um, we have a local health system. Um, we're in Carrollton, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta. So we have a local health system that just switched to the same EMR that we're on. So it actually gives us a good line of sight throughout the process. We're in our beginning stages, but it helped us look at quality, negotiate quality, negotiate price, and establish a conversation that allows us to not only look at what's already happened, but look at case management in real time. Uh, not waiting for a claim to come in. I think the timing of the data is the biggest challenge. Um, just trying to look at high cost claimants, by the time I get all the data together and the people on the phone, it's a foregone conclusion what's happening. So trying to mm -hmm. add to figure out what to do ahead of time is, is the biggest challenge. And that's where I think the employee experience and getting information from the employee and building that into the claims data will help you go a long way. Thank you. And Ned, um, you know, in, in your organization at U.S. Steel, um, it's, as a manufacturer, it's pretty clear that data are really important uh, to what you do um, because occupational health and safety is important to you. How have you dealt with this notion of, of data integration, patient-centered outcomes, business outcomes? You know, what are the, what are the, the, the goals you want to achieve and, and what are the roadblocks that you see in being able to get the data that you need to make your case with senior leaders that what you're doing is of real value to the company? Thanks, Tom. That's a very good question. From an employer's perspective, uh, you know, we, we see a huge gap between the data used to evaluate and manage different benefit programs and health plan designs and between the actual outcome, you know, Larry mentioned um, the, the statement from the patients, like, where do I end? I think that says a lot. You know, we're talking about, uh, we want to find out what is the quality and the outcome and result of these plans and programs. Uh, employers are generally making decisions and judgments on all these different programs and health plans based solely and I'm talking typically in most situations, based solely on claim cost data. This is mainly because of what was mentioned. It is very challenging to get data from other vendors. Uh, it is extremely challenging also to aggregate and integrate all that data together. But what we would like to have is have access to all that data integrated that includes 
you know, data from disability claim management, data from EAP, data from loss of productivity or gain of productivity, absenteeism, days away from work, um, workers' comp and injury and safety data, and see how those relate to the operation business metrics. And then look in addition to that also to the cost of the health plan and, um, and the uh, other programs. And if we would able to have access to all that data, integrated data together, uh, then I believe that we would have the ability to make more accurate decisions and have a crystal clear way uh, for judgment. And I think the outcomes would be better. Thank you. So we, we saw in one of the earlier slides and we asked who do employers rely upon and, and we found that primarily they rely upon experts within their company. Um, to a lesser extent, consultants, but then the, the list goes precipitously downward from there from the standpoint of brokers, health service vendors, TPAs, insurers, and the like. So Bruce, in your experience, and you've been uh, at least consulting medical director at several, several employers, if not medical director, why that internal focus and why not uh, rely on external experts and those that have data more than employers do? What's, the, what's going on there? I, I think there are a few issues um, that come into play. I think first is many employers are most interested in seeing their data um, and as such uh, are um, more content if they can uh, understand their claims experience and their trend. Uh, again, a more cost-focused approach. I think another issue that is at play is the fact that uh, m most employers from a competitive standpoint uh, don't feel strongly about having the best benefits. They are content with benchmarking against their peers to make sure that they have at least as good as uh, their peers so as not to uh, engender any uh, um, adverse selection for employees perhaps with uh, greater uh, health care needs uh, to select them as an employer. Uh, I think the other issue that we've talked about is the uh, challenge of integrating broader data sets, uh, again, to understand the value of the uh, health benefits as an organizational investment in workforce human capital, which is what we've essentially been talking about, as opposed to um, managing uh, benefits as a uh, as an expense. Okay, thank you, and Lisa. Who who are your key partners? Um, who do you rely upon in, in in making these kinds of decisions at Southwire? Well, I think we, we get a lot of direction. We're a private company, so we get a lot of direction from our, our shareholders um, and our board. Um, typically, the benchmarking we do, um, we do and we actually try to look at adjustments and adjusting for the demographics, geography, plan design, all those things. We just have really weird demographics at Southwire. A lot of <laughs> per employee and that's a good thing um, we just have to know that and we try to benchmark against ourselves every year using the same adjustments not so much as you know it was ten thousand five hundred dollars per employee per year but this is where we moved from and this is why we moved and we've started looking at it geographically for us because we've got a large group in Carrollton and then I have a whole bunch of people everywhere else in small groups so it's a little harder to, to talk about those things and to make design changes and integration changes. But um, for us, it's comparing against ourselves and how do we do it year over year and what was our intent. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> Ned, from your standpoint, um, who are your key partners at, at US Steel uh, in oh. helping you make the right decisions? Is that internally focused or do you really rely on external uh, parties as well, to a great extent. 
We have a hybrid approach. So we have uh, con con benefit consultants externally. We also get information from our health plans and PBMs, in addition to internal uh, folks from benefits, uh, from you know procurement, risk management. We also uh, are mostly unionized workforce, so labor relation and you know, benefit negotiations play a huge role in this. Uh, it's not like we can go out and make a lot of changes all of a sudden without talking to a lot of people. So uh, it is quite um, a road <laughs> and a journey to implement a program or to uh, make changes, especially that you have to go through all these uh, different teams and departments to um, get something implemented or even make a change or even if we are saying that it's a it's a better change or improvement others may disagree from their point of view okay you know we saw from from one of the slides uh, that last slide that you know on the one hand we do uh hear and see employers moving to you know wellness and well-being programs as a key part of of their initiatives yet we also saw from the employers we surveyed, for example, only 27% said they were very confident that uh, their health, their wellness and well-being programs were uh, contributing to the employee's ability to function. 27% said they were aligning with employee needs, values, and preferences. Uh, and 30% said they were contributing to improving good health. So. Why is it that at least the way the the wellness and well-being programs are being constructed seem to not really meet the goals that employers want? So, Larry, what's your, what's your take on that, um, particularly given your role at the court? So, so I think there's there's more to the wellness and well-being programs than delivering better health care, if you will. It goes to a culture. It goes to uh, the employer demonstrating uh, that it really does care about its employees. And you know, I, I'll give you an example. I, I come from Rochester, New York. We have a group of employers, um, you know, that meet regularly, and and we did community events. We, you know, back before everybody had a pedometer on their watch, um, we did um, a steps. Um, a program where we, we got all our employees in seven large companies and then ultimately the entire community taking steps, counting the steps, really getting involved. And and it, it creates a spirit, it creates a, a caring. And then when you you know you do those kinds of things, um, that goes to the productivity. That goes to um, you know people really feeling good about their employer and the work they do and the purpose that they're there for. So, so there's a lot more to it we have found than just the straight, uh, well, this is going to improve, um, you know, you know, whatever healthcare measure uh, we want. Um, and then secondly, it gives us license then um, to get involved in some other programs. And one of the things we did with the whole community in Rochester is we did a high blood pressure initiative where we literally took the people in control at baseline, we were at about 62%, and we drove it up to about 77, I'm sorry, 77 or 78% uh, people in control because we had built uh, a community spirit and a trust along with the physicians and the health plans and everybody else in the community to start to move that. So, you know, some of these base efforts have more to do with larger <coughs> initiatives going forward than they do about literally the thing that they are doing at the moment. And I think, Larry, that gets right to the point of, of how employers are thinking about what they measure to understand the, the benefit of their programs. And if you are stuck in the claims cost box, you're really limited to really seeing the benefit of the very things, Larry, that you mentioned. Um, Lisa, it, how have you approached wellness and well-being at Southwire, and how do you uh, put yourself in a position to interpret 
the impact of those programs? Well, I, I wish I had more wonderful things to, to say, but I think this is an area that we're still trying to to get our hands around. I think one of the goals that we have is trying to implement some type of app or opportunity for employees to engage at whatever level they're comfortable with and having information pushed back to them at pivotal points in, in either their health, their treatment, or their willingness to hear about things. So um, we, we've had a fitness center, we have on-site cafeteria, uh, healthy vending. We, we've had all of these things and they are very, very important. If you want to hear noise, you just mess with people's food and they, they get <laughs> uh, these guys are working 12 hours a day, you know, uh, and we run 24 seven. So you turn, you learn to understand that all of these things have a different place in people's mind. And while you can't make everybody do what you want them to do, you can make it harder to do things that aren't that good for them. Um, make them take an extra step or have financial outcomes on a healthy option for lunch. Um, those are the simple things I think, and giving fruit, that's something that, that we've done before, uh, giving it away. Those are the things I think that probably don't have a way to measure to know what the value of it is, but it surely is part of why people work at Southwire and why our shareholders give us the, the latitude to do that. And Bruce, you've written a lot about well-being um, over the last several years. You know, as you look at, at that result around the kind of disconnect that employers are not confident that their well-being programs are serving patient-centered needs, how do you close that gap? Bruce, did we Sorry, lose you? The biggest issue is that um, often employers do not uh, take the time or, or may not have the, the resources to actually speak to their employees, uh, perhaps in a, a focus group format, to understand what are the priorities, what are the needs. And I think as um, um, uh, Ned mentioned earlier, there is, a, or you did, a, a tendency to look for um, bright and shiny objects to incorporate into the plan design without understanding um, whether those are relevant to immediate employee needs. I think the other priority that accompanies that is that we are uh, we work in uh, in uh, communities of employees that um, are heterogeneous with respect to um, their particular um, needs, issues, concerns, and, and we need to understand um, the differences in those group and groups and cater to, um, uh, if we can, to uh, meet the, the needs of those um, subgroups in, in the best way we possibly can. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. <clears throat> so let's turn to, I think, what's uh, a, a key issue for employers on a lot of employers' mind is the tension between managing health benefits as an organizational expense and health benefits as human capital. And certainly we hear a lot about um, this discussion of health and human capital and what it means to the company. We certainly have heard a lot about that from our CFOs. We're actually right now designing new CFO research addressing that issue of health and human capital and business performance. But the employers that I talk to, I think, feel that tension. How do I, on the one hand, do the things I need to do to manage health and cost, yet demonstrate to my company that this is all worth it? So, Ned, at U.S. Steel, how do you manage that tension between the, the, the aspiration of, of healthy human capital and what it means to the business with the reality of managing health uh, and health costs and related expense. Thank you, Tom. It is definitely a challenge, and we try to provide education and um, try to have the organization and the teams understand what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. We try to build a business case to show uh, the benefits, uh, whether it's, 
you know process improvement in in some kind of um, in the healthcare setting or um, a program that would make uh, navigation of the healthcare system easier for our members or even you know as everybody uh, you know talks about a lot is to save to manage costs and re reduce the cost of the healthcare but it is definitely a challenge and uh it's it's something that we have to deal uh with every day and larry at xerox um was there tension between health benefits and senior leaders did they understand what you were achieving how did that how did that work what did they ask you for and how did you engage them in that conversation about the value of what you're doing in your programs well uh two things first of all um health benefits was table stakes i mean any large company has health insurance and you're not going to attract employees unless you have that kind of benefit getting senior management attention was relatively simple when you realize that revenue growth is being significantly outpaced by the increase in health benefit costs. That inflation in health benefits is, in my, in my many years in this, just unceasing. Um, and, and so you got their attention. Um, the real question was, so how do we, do it in a way that's affordable, both to the company and to the employees. And oh, by the way, um, there were many discussions where um, pay increases got into the conversation because uh, there was only so much money to go around. And you know, my my belief is that pay increases suffered because healthcare was eating up. Uh, a lot of the budget. So, so there wasn't any problem getting anybody's attention. The, the work every year was to try to figure out new and creative solutions to uh, getting more efficient, make, taking barriers away from employees, and trying to get them the right care at the right time the first time. You know, it reminds Please me, that help. Uh, Larry, that. Uh, Several years ago, maybe even a decade ago, I had a conversation with a colleague who was vice president of benefits for a very large oil company. Uh, and I was talking about these very same issues. And he said, you know, I can't get senior leaders attention on anything that we're doing in healthcare." And I thought, how could that be? And he reminded me that uh, the price of oil was about $100 a barrel and their company was rolling in money. Now today with oil, last time I looked, $30 a barrel is probably a different conversation. But what gets the employer's attention and the opportunity, as you say, to actually reframe that discussion uh, and bringing employees into it, I think is, is one of those things that uh, employers are, are facing right now. So Bruce, um, in your work with employers, you know, how have you seen, and I know you've worked with some very large employers, how have you seen that tension between managing health and cost and the the bigger aspirational goal of healthy human capital and business performance? I, I can tell you, Tom, that at, at two large corporations um, where I've worked, the leadership congratulated the benefits personnel for managing healthcare cost trend when, in point of fact, um, there was evidence that a significant minority of individuals weren't accessing healthcare because they could not afford it. Uh, the deductibles were simply too high, preventive services use was way down, and it, it creates a, a really difficult um, setting where. Uh, management of healthcare costs is, is viewed as the priority, I think in part because the leadership doesn't have the tools or, or data available to uh, quantify the value of the health that they are purchasing with their uh, healthcare expenditures. 
Um, so to me, the, the idea is, can we link the uh, data from disparate sources, as we've talked about, uh, to diffuse that tension by aligning the interests of business leadership and benefits personnel and the employees for that matter, to show that uh, improvements or investments in health create business value. Yes, they may add to organizational expense, but they may provide or create uh, disproportionate increases in, uh, in business revenue or business value. Uh, that are are absolutely measurable. So I think that mm -hmm. the aspirational goal is to integrate those disparate data sets. Uh, I, I think we are limited now because there are very few entities that actually merge medical claims and business performance data. It's got to be something that uh, companies do effectively on their own. Mm -hmm. And Lisa, from your perspective, um, is there that tension between what you're trying to achieve and and uh, and senior leaders, or are they uh, aligned with uh, with you and what your programs are doing? I have been um, very fortunate in that there there is a, a big part of that that's driven by our shareholders. I mentioned earlier they set the tone for how they want our employees to interact and to. Um, be a part of the community as well as Southwire. So, but I think the biggest challenge is understanding how dead complicated this stuff is. There isn't any logic, there's waste associated with it that wouldn't be allowed in any other area. So I think it's just very frustrating for people to be business oriented to tolerate this kind of behavior with vendors and healthcare when you wouldn't do it on the the other side of the business. So I think a lot of it is just, it's it's complex. It's more than a one pager. It's more than two sentences. It's more than a chart. It's it's the the life and the breadth of, of who you are and your culture and your people. So trying to, to bring that balance between the two is is what I view my job being. And uh, and I've got people fortunately who, who do listen. That doesn't That's mean they great. always do what we need them, want them to do, but <laughs> but they listen. <laughs> they do. They so we have some. It's a trust. I'm sorry. Um, we do have some questions from the audience in our last few minutes, and so uh, I'll um, ask those questions, and any of the panelists can respond. So <clears throat> one attendee uh, says, as you mentioned, most programs collect their own data, so employers do not have a comprehensive picture of what employees are doing from an ongoing health management to treatment of conditions. What are innovative approaches uh, for employers under, uh, taking better uh, attempts to connect wellness programs with medical claims and health benefits? Volunteers for that question? This is, I think what I would say is that um, yeah. The greatest innovation, I think, is bringing that information to the employees and getting them to engage with you. And um, that's, as I mentioned earlier, where we're spending a good bill of our time instead of finding more programs and services to add. How do we get the ones we already have to resonate and be ready to fail? You've got to be ready to fail if you're going to give it a shot. You know, one interesting question is, do employers ever enlist employee advisory committees to review and provide inputs on benefit programs to ensure the patient's perspective? Uh, Larry, did you do that at, at Xerox or anyone else on the panel? Have you used uh, employee advisory committees to help give you their perspective on what's important? Um, not, so, not, not so much a standing committee, but we certainly would at times go out, have, have round tables with employees and put various subjects in front of them as we were trying to think through, uh, you know, various uh, initiatives. Um, you know, lay out a question in, in front of a, a diverse population of employees and, and get their feedback. Anyone else on the panel want to address that issue about in employee directly involved? Tom, we uh, have benefit coordinators uh, that are part of the, uh, the union uh, and they have 
regular frequent meetings with our benefit folks and talk about different needs and ideas and there's there's a lot of uh you know back and forth in those meetings but there's definitely some also good feedback from that they would get from the uh union members okay um, there, uh, uh, can I just uh, add one other thing? You sure. asked about employees, but one of the other things I found particularly valuable was I actually convened a panel of physicians and asked them about the plan design. And I got some very surprising responses. As an example, primary care pediatri pediatrics, large group, the doctor said, don't lower your copay. I was completely shocked, and it turns out that they said they would have every runny nose in their office if it was free. Hmm. Interesting. Now, let's spend the last couple of minutes um, addressing, I think, what has become an important question uh, to employers as they grapple with these issues, and that is social determinants of health. So, Bruce, I'll, I'll ask you first in this question uh, from an attendee, you know, how do you bring social determinants of health into this framework um, and, and try to uh, develop programs that respond to those needs? I think from the, the employer standpoint, the most critical thing that uh, they can consider or acknowledge is that the workplace itself is a determinant of health. And whether that's policies and practices, the food that's in the cafeteria, the work schedule, uh, even pay are considerations that um, employers should take into um, their decision making process uh, when thinking about. Uh, social determinants and how those impact employee health and well-being. Uh, to uh, others' comments earlier, focus groups I think can be an incredible way of uh, for employers to essentially uncover some of their blind spots by eliciting uh, employee perspectives about uh, perceptions regarding social needs whether those are factors that are uh, uh, moderated by or a consequence of, of workplace policies and practices, or whether those are uh, community health needs that, um, that may be overlooked and the, the employers have an opportunity to intervene. Thank you. And, you know, Ned, U.S. Steel has plants in a variety of parts of the country, certainly different kinds of communities. How do you, um, you and, and your team deal with the issue of social determinants of health as they relate to delivery of health benefits um, to your employees in those different communities? Well, again, that's uh, definitely when you go t to different, when you go t when you and try to address different areas and different challenges, uh, you you have to again try to customize the needs for each area as they as they report the needs for and you know we talk about simple stuff like access to healthcare providers and which providers are in network so in in a more large uh large city the it's easy to find somebody that's in network, but that may not be the case in these rural areas where we have plants. And we have to keep that in mind and, and address that and sometimes even override some of our, our our policies to accommodate those needs. Okay. So Bruce, you know, I, I hear employers starting to talk about um, connecting their plan designs to things like uh, income level of their employees. Are you seeing that uh, as a trend to deal with that key determinant in, in what happens in health benefits? Um, certainly from the standpoint of, uh, well, two, two dimensions of that, Tom. I think 
uh, more and more employers are looking to increase wages to um, ensure that employees are uh, earning a living wage in their in their community, such a, uh, upon which they can they can survive and flourish. Uh, I think the use of um, wage-based benefit designs um, is still um, uh, under has been undertaken by by a number of employers, mostly the larger sized ones, but I think it's still a minority of uh, of companies. And unfortunately, we have really no evidence in the literature. Um, or from our experience, for that matter, as to what approach is best, um, how to do that. Thank you. I think for many employers, it's a feel good experience. All right. Well, we're right up against uh, our hour together. Uh, for those of you uh, who would like uh, either a copy of the research or a copy of all the um, the uh, exhibits from the research, from the, the full set uh, of analyses that, that we did, uh, my email address is at the bottom of the screen. Uh, I want to thank our panelists uh, for your participation today, and I certainly want to thank the Alliance for their partnership in doing this research and working on this project. Uh, and I would certainly say to everyone, stay healthy, stay safe. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.